As always, I'm thankful to be given the opportunity to stand before you, deliver a message from God's Word, especially on such a beautiful Lord's Day. Now, if you were to take a poll amongst folks today asking about what they thought or who they thought Satan was, what kind of answers do you think you would get? In times past, many have believed in Satan. Many also knew that it was their duty to resist him, to fight against him. I mean, today would take the idea that Satan is unable to lead anyone from the truth of God's word. And if you ask them to paint a picture of what they thought Satan was or what he looked like, you'd get the idea that he's a red goat man. He's naked and carrying a pitchfork. That's their concept of Satan. Going beyond that, they would think he's more of a metaphor for evil. He's in an idea or even an embodiment of evil. Now, though this is a convenient idea of what Satan is, this concept takes away the very personality of Satan, which we mortals must contend with on a daily basis. So obviously there is quite a bit of ignorance regarding Satan in, in today's world. So this morning, I'd like to take the time that we've been given to discuss the biblical doctrine of Satan. So we'll consider the definition of, of Satan. We'll look at some scriptural facts about him and overall some general considerations. So when you look at the word Satan, it comes from the Hebrew word Satan, which simply means adversary. Now this comes from the verb, Satan, a little bit different, which means to lie in wait. So literally, Satan means an adversary who lies in wait. The ISB, volume 4, particularly page 2693, has this to say about Satan. It gives a broad meaning. It says, Satan is a created but superhuman, personal, evil world power represented in scripture as the adversary of both God and men. So we're going to consider some things about Satan this morning to hopefully help arm us against our adversary. So first I'd like for us to consider some names that Satan has been given throughout the New Testament. He's called the tempter in Matthew chapter 4 verse 5. He's called the enemy, Matthew chapter 13 verse 39. The evil one in Matthew 13, verse 19 and 38, as well as 1 John chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. He's called our adversary, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He's the deceiver, Revelation 12, verse 9. He's painted as a dragon in Revelation chapter 12, verses 3, as well as chapter 20 and verse 2. Jesus calls him the father of lies as well as the murderer in John chapter 8, verse 44. He simply called the devil in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Later in Revelation 12, verse 9, he's called the serpent. We see in Paul's writings that he's referred to as the prince of the powers of the air in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. The ruler of darkness of this world, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And finally, he is called the god of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Let's take a few moments to consider his character. We see primarily in the New Testament that he is painted as the enemy of God and men. We see that Satan's jealousy and hatred of God has led him to be man's antagonist. As a result, Satan hates all things that are good. We can read in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 4 that Jehovah God is called the Holy One of Israel. Thus God's nature is totally holy. Jesus calls Satan the evil one as we just referenced in Matthew chapter 13 verse 19. 
Thus, Satan's nature is totally given to evil. We must note that Satan himself was not created evil. Ethical evil cannot be created. It is made only by each free will for itself. Thus, Satan was created as good. Now, at some point, he became evil through a fall. An evil will took the place of a good will. Thus, we have the evil one. Now, concerning his works, at least some of them, again, quoting from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, says the works of Satan are to be traced to one predominant motive. He hates both God and man and does all that in him lies to defeat God's plan of grace and to establish and maintain a kingdom of evil in the seduction and ruin of mankind. Now, this is done through deception and lies. Scriptures indicate that this is accomplished through wicked men who mislead other men. Now, typically, most often, these agents of Satan are themselves victims. Consider Judas Iscariot as well as the scribes and the Pharisees of the first century. Now, we know that Satan's power resides in his ability to deceive. His kingdom, then, is built on lies. His primary interest is destroying fundamental biblical truth. Thus, we would expect that Satan's doctrine is lies. Now, Jesus tells us in John chapter 8, verses 31 through 34, that his word and being obedient to it would free us from these things. He says, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. And we're never in, under bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Whenever we commit sin, we are the servant of sin. Thereby we are the servants of Satan. But it is the truth found in the gospel of Christ that can make us free from that. Jesus clearly taught that. One thing we must know must realize, come to grips with, is even though Satan can and will deceive us at some point, this does not remove our own personal guilt. An individual is, is deceived because he leaves the truth. We know in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, the, the Apostle Paul inspired says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, key there is lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the key is there is they received not the love of the truth. They also had pleasure in unrighteousness we have a more broad picture painted for us in Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through 32 if you don't love the truth the only thing that's left is a lie and that's what Satan deals in lies, deception Satan also works through persons and institutions primarily false teachers we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15, Paul again there says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You see, Satan evidently has the ability to make himself appear divine. After all, he is called the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. 
Therefore, we should expect any that would follow him should have the same ability. Whenever you deal with a false teacher, you don't see some ugly monster. You see a, usually a fairly put together individual that's more likely going to smell good. He's, he's clean shaven. He's probably showered within the last day. You know, they're going to be presenting what they say is the truth. But it's our job as Christians to determine whether or not what they speak is the truth. We, wouldn't, we need to be more like those Bereans, the noble ones, the noble Bereans that tested even the apostles. What are you saying? Is it lining up with God's word? Well, they found it to be so. But anybody that teaches something that is not in line with God's word needs to be dealt with accordingly. They need to be exposed for the false teachers that they are. But it's our jobs to do that. We find that in uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, where we're supposed to try the spirits. There's a, plenty of false teachers out there. I, the other day at work, Joel Osteen came up again. This was because of the hurricane. Talking about how he dealt last year with the hurricane and everything that he did not do to help people. He's got all these facilities that could be used. and The joke was he's out riding in his yacht in the, the floodwaters passing out his book instead of helping people. You know, he looks good. He, he's got a very charismatic personality. But he's, he's leading untold thousands to hell because of his doctrine of, of lies. Now, as we said, Satan works through institutions. The best example of that would be denominationalism. No one can disagree that, by and large, they do good works. It's a good thing to open a soup kitchen and pass out food to those who are needy. Unfortunately, none of these institutions can and will ever be able to save a soul, even though they claim to be able to do that. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, there's going to be a whole host of folks that did good works, and even in Jesus' name, but they weren't qualified to do so. They weren't added to his number. Therefore, they will receive, receive the same punishment as Satan and his, his angels. Again, quoting the ISBE, it sums up Satan's works very well, I think. It says, in combination of passages here brought together, it is clearly indicated that Satan is the instigator and fomenter of that spirit of lawlessness which exhibits itself as hatred both of truth and right and which has operated so widely and so disastrously in human life. You see, many people try to claim that God is the cause of all evil and whenever something goes wrong, at least what they think is wrong in their life, they automatically blame God. Whereas five minutes ago, they denied His existence. They always forget to say, Satan, why did you do this to me? Or better yet, me, why did I do this to me? Remember, if we don't love the truth, we love a lie by, there's only two options. It's either the truth or the lie. More often than not, we're in the predicament we're in because of our own choices. We can't blame God for that. Now we must consider the attacks of Satan. Going back to the beginning, there in the book of Genesis, we see a generic attack on the seed of woman. We see that Satan would tempt Eve, and then later Adam would follow her lead. By causing these two to sin, Satan murdered the human race. We know this from Romans chapter 3, verse 23, as well as chapter 5, verse 12. This would be why Jesus is able to say that Satan is a murderer from the beginning in John chapter 8, verse 44. Satan no doubt gloated over his apparent success. Then you have the prophecy found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It is at least possible that even Satan understood this to mean the fleshly descendants of Adam and Eve. So he sought out to disrupt God's plan. God's purpose. Later we can read of the account of Cain killing his brother Abel. 
Again, no doubt Satan was extremely happy and gloating over his apparent success. He just had a brother kill another brother. But I would like to think what he thought when, when Seth was born. You think he realized that the fight was not over? The fight had literally just begun? Because indeed it did. We see his next direct attack with the encouragement of the sons of God to intermarry with the sons of wicked men. We see this in Genesis chapter 6. Satan was quite successful in doing this. After all, we see that God was determined to destroy man, to wipe him off the earth. Yet we see Noah. Noah found grace in the sight of God. Therefore, God determined to save both Noah and his family. And we can read about that, what happened afterward. The great flood which destroyed all sin off the face of the earth. But Noah and his family were saved and they carried multitudes of animals with them to repopulate the earth. Then we see another direct attack from Satan. That comes with the children of Israel. We know that they were called to serve, serve God. God pulled them from Egypt, delivered them through the hand of Moses. And naturally, whenever, whenever anyone is doing anything right, that's going to provoke Satan. So we see his action, his attempts to cause Israel to stumble... And they were successful. In Exodus chapter 32, we see the, the building of the golden calf. Idol worship there at Mount Sinai. We see later throughout the book of Numbers, considering the wilderness wanderings, how many people were murmuring and bickering to Moses of really complaining to God and about God. You know, we had it much better back in Egypt. Yeah, but you were slaves in Egypt. You were being beaten in Egypt. You're being freed now. Through that period of 40 years, those who were determined to be unfaithful to God were weeded out, if you will, through their own lack of faith in God. They were punished. And then we see in 1 Samuel chapter 8 where the people of Israel demanded they have a king just like the, the nations around them. Samuel was, was upset by this because they thought they had turned their back on him. Well, that's partially true, but primarily God put him in his place. No, they didn't turn their back on you. They turned their back on me. You see, God was their king. The nation of Israel was a theocracy. But they chose to, to be more like those around them rather than to be the true nation of Israel in all that they were doing. You get a better idea for us as Christians in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We're not to be conformed to this world. We're supposed to be transformed. When I was at Ward Street I mean, a few years ago, in Bible class, they had a, a sign, of, a little poster on the Bible class door, and it had two chameleons, maybe it's three. They are on a branch, and you had two of them, I think it was three now, they had two of them that were green and one that was orange, and it cited that scripture be not conformed to this world. We are supposed to be different. Israel was supposed to be different. But they chose to follow after Satan rather than God. And we see through process of time that the, the great many kings of Israel, followed with the wickedness of the people, continued to get more wicked and would later be punished through captivity. And then they would later be dispersed because they broke their covenant with God. You see, they were promised that land of Israel while they were faithful. When they ceased to be faithful, they ceased to be recipients of that promised land. Next, we see Satan's attack on Christ. Shortly after the birth of Jesus, we see that Satan's working. He incited Herod to murder all the babies that were about Jesus' age. To murder the infant Messiah, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 23. Later, we would see the account of the temptation of Jesus just after his baptism, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. 
as well as Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And then we see in verse 13 there, it says, Satan left him for a season. I think it's easy for us to think that, oh, well, we have these two passages, they're parallels, and this was really the only time Jesus saw temptation. That's not at all the case. But note when that occurred. As we just said, it was right after his baptism. We should ex expect the same type of treatment from Satan. As soon as we're trying to be more faithful to God, what do you think Satan's going to do? Try to draw us away from God. In that account, Satan failed. Jesus used the word of God to defeat Satan. Certainly that is a pattern for us today. It is written, it is written, it is written. It worked for Jesus, it will work for us. Now certainly Satan would, would attack Jesus throughout the rest of his ministry. But later we would, we'll focus on his last assault of Christ. And that is the crucifixion. You see, I'm sure Satan thought he had won when Jesus was nailed to that cross. When he was beaten untold times and received the great mocking that he did. And then later would give up the ghost on that cross. Certainly Satan was exceedingly happy. I just killed the Messiah. But you see... This was God's eternal purpose. Back in Genesis 3 verse 15, like we referenced earlier, this prophecy was fulfilled. The heel of the seed of woman was bruised by that crucifixion. But then three days later, the head of Satan was bruised when Christ arose. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 9 through 16. So from that point forward, Satan has turned his attacks on the children of God. This began when the, the church was established in Acts chapter 2. And this will continue throughout the end of time. At which point, when this world is called into fire, all the elements will be burned up. Satan and all his followers will be cast into the lake of fire. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Now, if you've ever seen a wounded animal behave, or really anything that's, that knows it's close to dying, it's, it's going to be starting to act more erratically. At, at that point, it has nothing to lose. It knows it's going to die. So what, what do I care if I lose sooner or later? That's kind of how Satan is. He's a wounded animal in that respect. He knows his end. So he's going to try to drag as many people with him as, as Satanly possible. And he's going to do that through lies and deceit. And he's been quite successful thus far. We know in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 14, that few will be able to enter into the straight gate, to enter heaven. By and large, most people are not concerned and not pleased with spiritual things. They would rather enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You know, Moses gave that up to serve God. Most people would not. So next we'll take a look at some, some general considerations of Satan. The, relation, the relationship between God and Satan. There has always been opposition between these two. We know that earth is the spiritual battleground between God and Satan. And it is the choice of everyone here on earth to decide which side they will, where they will serve. Either serving the side of God or serving the side of Satan. As it's been said many times, you know, there is no such thing as a successful fence rider. Satan owns the fence. You cannot be neutral in this battle. There's no Switzerland. You're either for God or you're against Him. And Satan knows that. We must note that Satan himself is limited. Many times, it, it might feel that Satan is just as strong and just as powerful as God is. 
But we must remember that he is superhuman, but he is not divine. The New Testament points this out. The activities of Satan are cosmic, however, they are not universal. And again, he is doomed to a final destruction. He will be punished for all the evil that he has committed. So this morning we have discussed the biblical doctrine of Satan. In so doing, we've, we've considered what the term Satan actually means, how it's our adversary that is actively pursuing us, lying in wait. We've considered many of his titles, or not all of them, but there are many of his titles that are outlined in Scripture. We have also taken a look at his character, his works, and even some of his attacks. Now, while we are here in the flesh, we cannot escape his attacks. But we have the ability to be armed against them by putting on God's armor. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. You read that passage of Scripture, you, you get the idea that God is trying to call us into battle, and that's exactly what's going on. Because each of those pieces of armor is designed for defense. Then you have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which can be used as defense and offense. But then you have the shield of faith. The idea there is you're, you're able to quench the fiery darks, darts of the wicked one. If, if you end up having to retreat, give up ground because of your own ignorance, which is not necessarily wrong in and of itself, maybe you've not been able to progress as far as, as many others have, you still have your shield of faith. You're able to rest on your faith. At the end of the day, that's extremely important. You must not give up in this battle. Now being obedient to God's word helps us to not be ignorant of Satan's devices. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11. But if we're ignorant of God's word, we are ignorant of his devices. And we have considered a few of those this morning. But primarily, we must realize that he deals in lies. He deals in deceit. I think the biggest lie that Satan has been able to tell everyone is that you have enough time. Sure, in the beginning we see that Satan said, you will not surely die. And he's trying to destroy the, the biblical creation account through various ways and has been successful in the minds of many. But you see, even with error, I can correct myself. But if I think I have enough time, oh, I'll, I'll put it off until tomorrow. It's like the little, the little word picture that I saw quite a while back is there's a meeting for the procrastinators tomorrow. Okay? I might realize I'm wrong, but I, if I can keep putting it off, putting it off, I'll be okay. I'll take care of it another day. And then before that day comes... You may be in a car wreck. You uh, might get this coronavirus business. It could go on. And you're dead. You are now no longer able to correct the error that you committed in this life. Thus Satan gains another follower. Do you want to be part of the followers of Satan? I don't want to be. And I hope many, I hope all, would cease being servants of Satan, and I hope they would want to do better. Obedience to this gospel allows us to escape that destruction that is reserved for Satan and his followers. While we can't escape the, the fleshly attacks through his agency, we can escape his punishment, and that is through being obedient to Christ's gospel. We do this by obeying the gospel. We need to hear God's word and understand it. Romans 10, 17. We also need to believe that Christ is the very Son of God. John 8, 24. To repent of our sins, Acts three nineteen. To confess Christ before others, 
Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, and finally be baptized for the remission of our sins. Acts 22, 16. We referenced it earlier, but I'd like to read it for you now. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Peter there says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, who resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You see, I am not alone. Each child of God, being faithful to him, is not alone. Not only do they have their brethren, but they have God himself as their defense. We have to be sober, that's clear-minded, and vigilant, always on guard because our adversary, the devil, seeks us out. I was always told, as soon as you become a Christian, there's a giant bullseye that's painted on your back. And that's exactly how Satan sees us. A fresh target. You see, anyone that's of the world, he doesn't necessarily care about. He's already got them on his side. But as soon as someone defects and joins the ranks of Christ's army, you just upset Satan. He wants you back. And he's going to do everything in his power to call you back. Now sometimes the child of God can't hear that call and can even stumble to answer back. Maybe slip back into the old ways of, of doing things. And if that is indeed the case, we do have an advocate with the Father. We typically call it the, the second law of pardon. James chapter 5, verse 16, repentance and prayer. Uh, John, 1 John chapter 1, 7 through 9. Repentance and prayer will restore us into a proper relationship between our, ourselves and our Creator. So if you need to become a Christian this morning, or if you need to remove the sin in your life through repentance and prayer, please make the step to have that sin removed, to become righteous in the sight of your God. So if there is a need, let us take this time to have that need fulfilled as together we stand and sing.